Kia ora, no mai haere mai, welcome, greetings from New Zealand Aotearoa. Mr President, Ministers, guests and a special thank you to my friends at Iceland Air for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. It's been 17 years since I last visited Iceland, um, it was the middle of the winter, I never saw beyond 20 feet in front of my nose, so the last couple of days have been wonderful and I've seen a, a different side uh, and to Iceland and what Iceland offers and probably expanded my sense of belief in the opportunity that I, I think the last presentation really spoke of. Watching that last presentation reminded me so much of where New Zealand was um, 15, 20 years ago and so hopefully today in the next half hour I can give you a sense of where we got from that space to where we are now. So the way I'm going to talk through this is to start by giving you just a little bit of an overview because I'm not sure, can I have a show of hands, how many people have been to New Zealand? Okay, that's about what I expected. <laughs> but I want to give a sense, a little bit of a sense of New Zealand and why the New Zealand comparison I, I think is very interesting. Then talk about the work that came out of a combined industry and government tourism strategy, and that has been reviewed two or three times in the past 20 years. Talk through what Tourism New Zealand's part in that was, and Tourism New Zealand is the organisation I work for. End up talking a little bit about where the campaign is today. Have to talk a little bit about Hollywood, um, because Hollywood has been quite important, or we refer to Wellywood, um, meaning Wellington, where most of the production's done. And then I think it's important just to talk about some of the measures of success. If there's time, I'm also going to show you uh, the Icelandic preview of a, a new television commercial, or a new commercial that will go into theatres before The Hobbit, The Unexpected Journey. So first of all, just for any of you that haven't been, New Zealand is literally diametrically opposed to Iceland. Um, we share a lot in common with Iceland. We're both two very geologically young destinations and we're also three, three hours by flight from our nearest neighbour. Um, we, I suppose, suffer the same sort of relationship with Asia um, that, that you do with both North America and, and Europe being sort of close enough that you can be a short stay uh, but many of our other markets are quite a distance away. It's important also to put the context of where tourism fits in the New Zealand economy. Tourism at the moment is our second largest export earner behind dairy. At various stages we, we fight a little bit with dairy as to who's, who's the biggest or the best. A high, high New Zealand dollar at the moment gives dairy an advantage. We contribute... We, Tourism accounts for 1 in 10 jobs in New Zealand, contributes 4% of GDP and rising. I think numbers that are quite similar to the Icelandic situation. Arrivals have continued to go upwards. New Zealand has um, practically doubled visitor numbers every decade since the year 1900. Obviously, when the numbers start getting big, that is more difficult, hence the problems that arose in 1990 when we sort of looked and thought, can we keep doing this? And to do this, how can we do it? Importantly, you'll see in that, we also did suffer quite a dip in 2008 with the recession. And really what it was was quite a watershed for New Zealand because in 2008, we saw a huge drop-off in visitors from Europe and a huge increase in visitors from Asia. And some of that was down to to situation and the emergence of the Chinese middle class that the President spoke of, um, but also a lot of it was down to marketing, needing to look at where our advantages were, look at what sectors were resilient and who would keep coming at a time like that. But importantly, when we look at our visitors, and, and this is, I think, a, a first, first lesson for Iceland, is you need to have a portfolio of visitors. You need to understand who comes when and for what. And when we look across that pile there, you'll see that despite the fact that I've just mentioned a lot of the European markets are dropping away, they still account for most of the visitor nights. 
So arrival numbers don't mean everything. Visitor night's what counts. That's what fills your restaurants, fills your bars, fills your hotels. So you've got to get that right. I'm a little bit rude. I talk of Chinese equivalents. So for me, one German is 12 Chinese equivalents. <laughs> one German will stay for 28 nights. One Chinese will typically stay for three or four nights. So that is the size of the issue. So it's who you want, when you want them, and that determines where they will go, what they will consume, and what products you have to have in place. Unlike you that has Europe on your doorstep and also North America, we only have Australia where we can try and address seasonality um, and try and get people travelling year-round or to come and ski. So I think great opportunities for Iceland's there. Also, cruising is huge for us. It's grown from 20,000 to over 100,000 in the space of five years for us. There is no way we can develop the infrastructure in many of our small cities without cruise ships. And finally, just to contrast the similarities, our, our list of strengths and weaknesses. And I suspect that blue zone is exactly the spot where Iceland now sits. Beautiful, spectacular landscape, green credentials, a protected environment, all of those things would be held very passionately. But as you go down the list, probably many of the similar problems that we've got. So when you get at the bottom of that list and you see, uh, not known for our nightlife, not known for our cities... And importantly, the one that absolutely tripped the question of what we needed to do to have a long-term sustainable tourism industry is how do you get seen in a modern, cluttered world? So I now want to talk about the 100% pure New Zealand story. It is one of the most enduring and acclaimed tourism campaigns of recent times. It has been running since 1999, unchanged, which is quite unusual in tourism circles. I should explain that I work for Tourism New Zealand. Tourism New Zealand is a government-funded promotional agency. We claim to be the oldest in the world. We were established in 1901, and we've had many, many different shapes. But in the 1990s, we said, look, our job is marketing the country. Our mandate from government is to improve the value of inbound tourism arrivals, and we focus entirely on that now. Prior to that, we sold travel, we managed hotels, spas, resorts. Now we're purely and simply a marketing body. So the work I'm now going to show you came about um, from industry getting together and saying, we need a future. And what was the real problem? Well, the real problem was that we at that stage had offices in 20, 20 markets around the world. Each of those ran campaigns as they saw fit for each market. So we had some wonderful campaigns in some markets and some absolute rubbish in other markets. In, in, in one European market, it was New Zealand like every piece of Europe. I mean, how compelling is that? Um, and some of, them, some of them were just absolute rubbish, and we paid a lot, of, a lot of money, and we just got no cut through. There was no clear and concise message. If you asked people around the world what New Zealand stood for, the two most common things that came out, and please you're not allowed to laugh at me, I'll just, I cringe at this. Like Australia, but with sheep. <laughs> or, just like England 30 years ago. <laughs> now, bear, bear in mind that is 15 years ago when retro wasn't cool. It's, it's probably all right, we could probably get away with just like England 30 years ago. A lot of people had come to that. But, but really, and the other thing is we had no clearly defined target market around the world. So, so what did we do? We, we said, but no, just before I get to that, I thought it was appropriate at the 75th anniversary to actually pull a slide of how we marketed 75 years ago. And I suspect if you took Pania, the Maori maiden, out of the front, you could probably almost have Iceland as a volcano, uh, there are um, geysers and, and mud springs. But probably the most offensive was this, and this was really our view of what the world wanted to see. All the lovely adventure tourism activities, a little bit of Maori culture, um, but even then the Maori culture, we managed to get a boat in behind it. Um, we thought the world wanted golf courses, hotels and food. Um, really, um, what, what would that tell you? It could be anywhere, and, and that was our problem. So the brief to the agency was create a campaign that would give the world a taste of what is unique about New Zealand. 
We wanted to get away from those sheep. We wanted to get away from those older feelings. And we wanted to have something that would be bold and stand for New Zealand, something that would cut through and resonate with past visitors and something that would incite and motivate new visitors. We also looked at who were we trying to attract. And quite clearly in the old days, it really was quite crudely to find anybody that has a passport in most markets. Um, in some markets, um, we did a, a lovely demographic job and, and you know, Japan, and, and we still have trouble convincing my Japanese colleagues not to market by this, and they had silvers and office ladies and, and a lot of those types of phrases. But what we wanted to do was say, what does New Zealand need to be, and who would be our ideal visitor? So we came up with this concept of the interactive traveller. And it was quite unusual amongst many tourism boards at the time who generally were targeting along very demographic lines, and we went for a psychographic. So an interactive traveller, and I'd, I'd see them walking along the street of Iceland if I walked out now, generally somebody that would be walking around with a laptop under one arm because they're going to do most of their searching for their destinations and holidays online. They're going to be somebody that would be driving their rent, own rental car because they want to show themselves around. Somebody that's a frequent international traveller, someone that likes natural beauty, and someone that's interested in culture. So all the hot points of, of New Zealand, and dare I say it, probably a number of the hot points of Ireland. So really worked on all of those. So that was the interactive traveller. We did agree at the time as an organisation, because there was a lot of, lot of debate and, and people weren't quite so happy about this, that um, we used lines like, sacrifice and overcommit. We had to accept that we couldn't be everything to everybody. We had to be single-minded in what we were doing. So, yes, we got lots of coach tours. Yes, at the time, we got lots of cruises. Yes, we got a lot of people that were going around New Zealand on party buses. But the main purpose, and or the main group we were going after is interactive travellers because they stayed a long time and they spent a lot of money. And that was important to us. And they got around and saw the countryside. The other one that, that was always used was, will this make the boat go faster? We had a famous New Zealand sailor. And um, as a maritime nation, you'll understand. And Peter Blake, or Sir Peter Blake, won the whip bread round the world a couple of times. And his view was, if it won't make the boat go faster, throw it overboard. So if you sailed with Peter around the world, you didn't have a toilet seat because that wasn't making the boat go faster. And that's what we had to take to our marketing. The idea that the agency came back was 100% pure New Zealand, and it is designed to be unique. It's, it's to talk about the experience of New Zealand, not just a narrow notion of natural beauty. And we used it in conjunction with images to reinforce uh, that image. You'll see the little quirk is to put the map of New Zealand in as the 100% motif, just so we can have some ownership over that line. And that is the line that has now stand, stood the long test of time. Some of the earlier examples of 100% pure, and starting from the side closest to me on the main screen, at the very early stages, lots and lots of remote landscapes, but no people. Beautiful scenic shots. I mean, there was a shot very similar and your last presentation with a beard. Well, we, we put pianos. Um, that was a, a play on the piano, a film, an Oscar-winning film by Jane Campion. The one on the far side um, was probably midway through probably about 2007, 2008. We've managed to get people into that, but you'll see they're sort of right about the middle of the photo, and most people don't see them. And the one in the middle is from about year 2000, where we've actually almost got the people into the, right into the front. Um, but really, they are just showcasing a natural environment. Now, all of those images did absolutely what they were set out to do. Strong, had New Zealand strongly associated with a wonderful landscape, nature, and the environment. In fact, probably put us too close to the environment, and a lot of the time we were fighting issues about clean and green, which is not what the campaign was about. We are fortunate, being a small country of 4 million people, a long way away from everybody else, that we haven't fouled up the environment. It is not necessarily that we have been as good as we, 
we could be or as good as we should. And it remains a 100% pure promise as a reminder to the tourism industry that they need to protect that. That is the core of our brand and to keep pushing it and championing it. And, you know, and that is an area where there's always conflict, particularly with industry. What that brand and what those images I just showed you did, however, was a comparatively weak job on the urban environment, um, indulgence, so luxury and premium product, which particularly was important for North America, and events and festivals. So behind all this paid campaign work I've shown you is a lot of work. Um, visiting media, unpaid media, we host between 150, 200 journalists a year to New Zealand to experience the 100% pure experience. Um, last year we had 2,000 alone for the Rugby World Cup. So they go away and they're our ambassadors. We work a lot on stunts. Um, this one captured a, a, in the shot here is a stunt, um, a giant inflatable rugby ball. And, and I'm, I'm hoping a number of you will know what rugby is, although I'm sure Iceland is not a rugby giant in the world. Um, but it is for small countries like New Zealand. Last year we won the Rugby World Cup back in New Zealand. But to promote that fact, we developed a giant inflatable rugby ball, which inside was about half the size of this ballroom. And when you went inside, it was a 360-degree panoramic video of, of New Zealand. And we took it to Paris under the Eiffel Tower here, London under the Tower Bridge, Sydney under the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and also back to Auckland. Um, and hosted dignitaries, influences. Um, I had the honour of hosting the Queen um, when it was in London. Um, also a lot of associations. I spoke, said that this campaign has often seen, and, and the Prime Minister at the time it was launched, when we said, Prime Minister, do you like the campaign? And she said, it looks like a bunch of bucolic peasants frolicking through the countryside. Which is not necessarily what you want your Prime Minister to say about your campaign. So we did need to make sure that we did a lot of work, particularly in the premium space, to get New Zealand associated. So there are a lot, a lot, a lot of imagery in other areas that show luxury lodges in pristine setting, um, like, like many of the images before, dining outside, catching helicopters to the tops of mountains and having those high-end experiences. Also, association with food and beverage. New Zealand wines, particularly New Zealand white wines, Sauvignon Blanc, hopefully many of you have tried New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, New Zealand signature wine, right across the world. Once those types of products are making headlines, it's easy to associate your brand to them. One, one of the, the classic truisms in tourism marketing is when you change your marketing manager, you usually change, change your agency. When you change your agency, you usually change your campaign. This campaign has managed to, to withstand two prime ministers, uh, two chief executives, six marketing managers and three agencies. However, it is important that your campaigns move with time it is important that they have life. It is important that they're relevant to your audiences and where you are showing them. As you look through those four positionings, two things really are in common. The spectacular landscapes keeps coming forward. And as you move through in the last, probably the latter half of the campaign, the word experience comes out quite strongly. And now when you look at the refined positioning now, you see people having a bigger role, and particularly the role of people, experiences and landscape and the stories that bind them all together. If we look at our volcanoes and you're out in a tourism setting with a Maori and a Maori are our indigenous people, with a Maori guide, they won't say, look, there's a volcano, it came up through the ocean. They will tell you the history as to, to why that volcano is there, what it means to their people, and how important, how important things are. There are four volcanoes in the central North Island, um, three clustered closely together uh, and one far away. And the story very much is that um, one volcano, the small one, uh, is a Maori maiden, um, and she had an affair with one of the other volcanoes, and the other two beat up um, that chap, and that's why the volcano's over there. Now, if you're out with me and I'm telling you that in situ, 
really, really powerful. So, you know, when you look at how New Zealand scores and um, Future Brand, are a large global uh, cons- uh, brand consulting agency, last year New Zealand scored number one on natural beauty. Um, Iceland was number six, so well done. But on authenticity, um, we were at number four. Iceland was at number six. And the reason that we were on the authenticity scale very much is about stories and maintaining your heritage. We didn't actually score so well on the, on the tourism side, which I think is an absolute nonsense because uh, it's about shopping and things like that. So we lost to Paris. Um, the other, other evolution of the campaign, and I want you to concentrate on words so I didn't keep showing you pictures, is that... Um, you know, you have to constantly rethink your campaign and keep it relevant. So the first 10 years that I've displayed there were all about a campaign that was designed for awareness. We felt that people didn't know where New Zealand was. Now, once we got to 2010, and, and I mentioned you, you survived successive CEOs, the new CEO came in and said, and he was actually um, from Yahoo, so he was kind of in the online space, and he said, look, I, the thing I can't understand, you, you're wanting to continue to run awareness campaigns and um, really, isn't your problem really a conversion problem? And everybody else, of course it is. You know, we were telling people, come, but we weren't really telling them what the New Zealand holiday experience would be about. So we were still a set of moving picture postcards with some engagement, but we really weren't converting. So, you know, if you look at the, the situation in North America, 22 million North Americans have New Zealand in their top five desired destinations, yet we get less than 200,000 a year. So, under the old campaign, we were actually going off to try and grow that 20 million. Under the new campaign, we're out there trying to convert that 20 million and increase the 2 million. So, this, this piece came around, it wasn't, and I, and I sort of say it was sort of a hit in the head. We had realised, I, I moved to Australia, and all of a sudden I, I woke up one morning and realised I was watching the same advertising in Australia that I'd been running in North America. If Australians don't know about New Zealand, well, I'm sorry. Um, the, the, there's, a, there's a standard joke that every time a New Zealander goes to Australia, it, it raises the IQs of both countries. But <laughs> e- even, even so... Um, the Australians are not so stupid that they couldn't see a bit about New Zealand. So we actually had to change. And the campaigns in Australia are all about some of the issues that were addressed before. Seasonality. I spoke about Chinese equivalents. Why would you want a dirty, cheap Australian coming, sleeping on his cousin's couch, drinking his duty-free beer in the middle of summer? You know, you want them coming in winter or an off-season. So design different campaigns for different people at different times of the year something you spoke very, very well about. So when we moved from awareness to a conversion campaign, we also changed our target audience. So we went from interactive travellers to what we call its active considerers. And that really is very much about a group of people that have put their hand up and said, yes, I know about New Zealand, yes, I want to go to New Zealand, but it did tell us a few other things. It did tell us that perhaps we'd got some of our thinking a little bit wrong, And one of them was that because we'd spent so much time showing people jumping off mountains, bungee jumping, New Zealand's the home of bungee jumping, jet boating, and a whole lot of extreme outdoor adventure sports that would terrorise most of them. Most of them actually just wanted to come and look at it and, and, and take photos. And when you look at some of those images before, you think... Well, I have to walk down you know, for six hours tramping through the bush to get to that beach. When the, the simple fact is, I mean, we didn't carry the piano for six, six hours um, down the beach. We just drove to the edge and carried it out. So we changed the campaign, and the campaign has really become about showing people enjoying themselves and how easy it is to do. So the campaign now is really about accessibility, popularity, and fun. So... Oh, sorry, I thought I had images next. So just before I go to some images to show that, um, just also should add the, the other, other piece that was really critical, that when you go from an awareness campaign 
to a conversion campaign, it was the engagement of partners. And um, all of the work during 100% pure early years was totally branded Tourism New Zealand with no calls to action to partners. We had calls to action to our website, but no airfares on the edge, no three nights hotels, none of that. When we made the shift in the last couple of years, it was to embrace partnership because people want to know. They want to do the comparison shopping. They want to know how much it's going to cost, how do I book it, how long is it going to take, all of those tangible. In a time-sparse environment, people want some of the answers. So, so that's uh, just something I just wanted to touch on there. As you can see, these are just some images from some online work that was run last year. As you can see, people, tourism infrastructure, right in the front row. So as people know that when they go to New Zealand, they actually can see, touch, feel and sniff the product. These are all online banners. And one of the other ones is one in the middle you see there with Ia Tahiti Nui. Not only did we embrace partnership with New Zealand or sellers in market, but we also realised that many people that want to take a long trip do want to stop off. And in the case of New Zealand, if we're trying to encourage more North Americans to travel outside of our peak summer season, we want them to be sure that they'll get some sun on the way back by going to Tahiti, Fiji or the Cook Islands. The other huge change when we moved campaigns was to change our media mix. Prior to 2010, 87% of our budget right around the world was spent in television, out-of-home advertising, so billboards, um, subway cards, bus shelters, and print. 13% was spent online. We turned that on its head overnight and moved to an environment where close on 90% of our budget is now spent online. It means that we're very efficient media buyers. We get the message in front of our target audience all the time um, at a far lower cost. Um, we can measure it. The problem that we are still grappling with is in a one-dimensional space, how do you actually mess with people's hearts and minds? And when we are talking to a group that is sitting with New Zealand on their bucket list, how do we motivate them and make sure that they are still inspired to come to New Zealand? So that is, that is a task we're battling with, and I'll explain how we're doing a little bit of that with Lord of the Rings and The, uh, the Hobbit in a minute. Also just wanted to sh throw this one up, because this is the future of travel for us. Um, Online environment is a, is a huge part of where our visitors will go for us, and you'll see that in, in the later presentations. And really, this one, just all this one does, and I could have shown any number of slides, the number of people that are engage, engaging with Facebook um, after they've visited you. So, you know, so important. Quality standards, we rigorously measure, measure quality standards within the industry, um, really important. If you want people writing nice things about you, service is important. And in an industry, and I, I sympathise with you, that is generally considered lower skill, transient, and high turnover, it is very hard to maintain these standards. So just summarising that piece, word of mouth, while all of what I've shown you is about 100% pure New Zealand, word of mouth is probably still the, the, the most influential medium. All of what we do, all we really want to do is prompt people to talk about New Zealand. Get that conversation started. Enough people have been. A lot of the research we've done in most markets says the one thing that will trip people over um, to actually making that choice to come put it to the top of the bucket list is somebody that says, wow, I went to New Zealand. It was an absolutely fantastic time. Best holiday of my life. Unpaid media, I've already mentioned. Social media, similarly. The film I'm going to move on to, um, trade, trade uh, really is important. We are leading a cross-industry or cross-government project at the moment to try and get all government departments and then industry to get behind a single unified New Zealand story. It won't be 100% pure New Zealand. A lot of companies don't want it. Um, we're unashamedly black in our branding, which is the colour of death for food. 
doesn't work necessarily in the food. 100% pure in the environmental credentials does work, but in a lot of others, it's, particularly in uh, um, IT industry, technology industries doesn't work, but important. Education, huge for us. Sports and politics plays a big part. And as mentioned by the President, um, volcanoes and earthquakes. Um, we've, we've suffered from both um, in recent time, both the, the Iceland volcanoes, Chilean volcanoes and our own volcanoes, um, just in the last month, in fact, and, and a catastrophic earthquake in, in New Zealand. But it does get you headlines. It does get people talking about you. And, you know, you've just got to find how you use that in your marketing communications. Now I just want to move on quickly to talk about the role of Hollywood in all of this. Um, we've had uh, the wonderful opportunity, or have been graced with the opportunity, of Sir Peter Jackson um, being a passionate New Zealander. He's actually quite hobbit-like in stature. He's a short, rather rotund, hairy man. And uh, with an absolutely immense imagination and an incredible, incredibly immense passion for movie making, you know, you can, see, you can watch films from his parents' home camera when he was four and five years old, when he was building King Kong sets in his lounge and blowing people up. So he's been, movies have been his passion for so long. And around the year 2000, he undertook an ambitious project, which was The Lord of the Rings. And he originally went around Hollywood um, trying to encourage studios to underwrite his project and he wanted to make one movie and he got to New Line Cinema and said, but it's a trilogy, isn't it? Why wouldn't you make three movies? And Sir Peter, never missing a good opportunity, said, absolutely, that sounds really good. Um, when do we start? So, so we were wonderful. So we had three years plus of incredibly good fortune with Lord of the Rings. We're about to start from December this year of another two and a half years with a trilogy of The Hobbit. So I just want to show you, because I know film tourism is a big opportunity and you, you see a lot of it here in, in Iceland. Probably it's worth pointing out this here, despite... And just remember this when I show you all the images and everything we're going to do in the next piece. This is the only authentic Lord of the Rings and Hobbit attraction in New Zealand. This is the only place that you can actually visit where you will see what you see on the movies. This is a farm set um, in Matamata, which is this tiny little place that the Visitor Information Centre used to get 10,000 people a year, now gets a quarter of a million a year, um, people looking to go to here. Um, and Peter Jackson sent a helicopter over the whole country looking for the site that he thought looked like the Shire and settled on this. For the Hobbit, they've left the Hobbit holes completely intact. They've, in fact, built a hotel, the, the Green Dragon, um, and it will be, for want of a better word, a themed Hobbit experience. Everywhere else you go, you can look at the scenery and you can see where sequences were shot, but at the end of the film they had to tear everything down or alternatively it was all computer generated. However, we've made a tourism industry off the back of it. Back in 2000, well, in 2000 I can remember ringing the chief executive and saying, we've got this movie or series of movies coming out um, around Lord of the Rings, um, I think they're going to be important for us. And the response I got back is, what a load of nonsense. Um, sacrifice and overcommit. We don't want anything, any, anything to do with this. It's all going to be computer generated. Um, we can't detract from our campaign. After year one, they started to see my way of thinking. Year two, um, they were all over it as it started winning Oscars. And you can see we... Uh, started running ads about best supporting country. Um, our website changed. We took up, after the first movie, the nomenclature Home of Middle Earth. Air New Zealand started painting their planes, uh, much to my urging, with Hobbit scenes and became the official airline to Middle Earth. But everything we did was around the periphery. At that time, probably the best example of film tourism in our part of the world was Crocodile Dundee. Now, hands up, who's seen Crocodile Dundee? Hands up if anybody had a more positive attitude of Australians after watching that movie. <laughs> you know. 
And um, even Australians cringe at the line, another shrimp on the barbie, mate. Um, so, so film tourism really wasn't seen. So we were, we were sort of wondering where it was. The research says after three of these movies that only 1% of our visitors came because of the movie. Well, 26,000 visitors. Old Bank, $35 million, thanks very much. Uh, 6% said it was a major reason. And Lord of the Rings above everything else has probably got us a family market because in the past, who wants to fly 24 hours from Europe with your kids? But now you can make them watch nine hours of movies, just about covers the whole trip. And when they get there, they want to see these things. So 6%. But the important thing is 46% of visitors did a Lord of the Rings-inspired tour or product when they were there. And as I say, most of them were get out of a a vehicle over there, that's the Mines of Muria, that's Mordor. Now, I, I've just been out for an hour and just out of Reykjavik here, and it looks exactly the same. So, so think about that when you're looking at the films that are, that are filmed here. But the important thing was 94% of our target audience associated the films with New Zealand. So what better opportunity to get people talking about you? When we started with The Hobbit and we said, do we do a, a, a campaign like we did previously, which we hang on the edges, and, and if it goes really well, try and um, associate ourselves with the success um, and just give away a few prizes and things like that, or do we immerse ourselves entirely in this? We asked our target audience again, uh, were they aware of the movies? 57% said they were. Um, do you consider yourself a fan of The Hobbit as a series of books? 58% said yes. Um, but 87% said they were aware of them being filmed in New Zealand. So we realised what a huge opportunity this would be for us. And fortunately, the government intervened and brokered a deal that allowed us to have special status with Warner Brothers, the distributor. I'm going to show you, as I say... Um, a two-minute commercial that will run in many markets around the movie. But I just want to, before I get to that, just show you a couple of examples of some of the, the creative work that's going to run. Sorry. First of all, to make sure the association is absolutely 100% cemented, everything will run under 100% Middle Earth, 100% pure New Zealand. Huge departure for us. We've never, ever messed around with 100% pure um, but we are here. That's the scale of the opportunity. But, and then our whole campaign um, for the next, potentially, two and a half, three years will take on a Hobbit-esque feel to it. Now, we refer to things as Hobbit light and Hobbit heavy. This is an example of Hobbit light. So if you went to NewZealand.com now, you would see Hobbit light and you will see these images that really, at the moment, don't have context to the movie, but when you, when you see some of the later material, you will. But it, it speaks in a language that's becoming of the movie. When you move to Hobbit Heavy, the same style of images are going, and the website will turn to this myth, medieval scripting style that Tolkien himself used when illustrating the books, and as you peel back, these are online banners, it will peel back to what New Zealand is in the reality. So the whole theme of the campaign is New Zealand, Middle Earth, where fantasy meets reality. It is saying to people, you can see these beautiful vistas in the movie, but you can actually go and experience them. Now, just thought, should just close on a, a few pieces in terms of measuring success. Uh, it's very easy to stand up and show lots of lovely pictures, but I did really just want to, to show what the New Zealand industry, Tourism New Zealand and the New Zealand government, have achieved over this period. And again, as you can see, everything sort of, all these imagery is now a little bit hobbit, hobbity, you know, they're heading off down the hills. They should have capes on rather than backpacks. When we started the campaign, New Zealand attracted 1.6 million arrivals per annum. By 2006, that had got to 2.3 million, 
And right through the recession, we've still managed to move to 2.6 million. Now, by way of comparison, if you were to look at the three countries that we benchmark ourselves against, Canada, the United States, uh, United Kingdom and Australia, during that same period, 1999 actually to 2004, when we grew 50%, Canada grew 4%, the United Kingdom grew 13%, and Australia grew 23%. So the power of having an industry that was working as one and, and moving. I think the more important thing is actually the bottom line. It is about money. It is about what's earned. Now, the, the figure would be better but for the fact that the New Zealand dollar is at historically high levels. And just on the final one, New Zealand set themselves a task 15 years ago to develop a country brand, um, particularly for tourism, but for further. So we had pretty big, ballsy aspirations. And I think that in itself um, speaks to how successful we've been as well, that now New Zealand sits number three in the Future Brands Country Index, um, alongside some big players, but also some other small players like Switzerland. And that's an index that measures tourism and a whole lot of things. So the fact that we've jumped to number three is because we had a unified vision and we brought the industry along with us. My challenge is Iceland, which currently sits at a, a very good 19. Where could you be in 15 years? Now, just in closing, I'd just like to show you the video that will go into many markets. Sadly, not Iceland, but it will be online um, before... Peter Jackson premieres The Hobbit, The Unexpected Journey in December. Thank you very much. Your journey starts beneath southern skies, where glacier and ocean meet, a land where giant eagles once guarded the skies, where creatures dwell in ancient caves, Streams that run hot feed rivers that run cold. And where warrior princesses know how to warm your heart. Where wizards turn water into wine. And where the people of the land can fly. Where four-legged creatures swim. Where sea creatures walk on land. Where you can blaze a trail through blades of gold. Metal hawks saw. You can dine above the clouds. Where treasure is found underfoot. And where creatures come out under moonlight. Traveller, your dreams are waiting.